Hi, thanks very much. Yeah, so um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm one of the PMC members on Airflow. I'm also the director of Airflow Engineering at Astronomer.io. Um, so I kind of head up the open source Airflow team team there. Um, and yeah, kind of, I did it myself uh, and Catchall together. We did most of the work on on kind of rearchitecting and rearchitecting and rewriting the scheduler for HA and performance. So kind of, I thought I'd be interesting to give you a, a kind of a deep dive into to how it now works. Um, so yeah, um, the scheduler, it's, um, this, this was a term I saw someone mention on Twitter. Uh, apologies to whoever it was because I can't find it anymore. But yes, the scheduler is the load-bearing infinite loop of Airflow. It sits there in a loop um, and it, it just kind of runs tasks. So um, yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. That, that was it. <laughs> what more would you want to know? Um, I'm clearly joking, what with that being three minutes into my talk. Um, so what does the scheduler do? Well, um, it, it starts tasks on a schedule, right? You know, that's it. You could you could write that in a, an hour, surely. Um, oh, but it also checks the trends between tasks. And re uh, uh, you get the idea. There's an awful lot that the scheduler is responsible for. It is more than just running tasks on, on schedules. Um, and this was just the ones I could fit on a slide. I kind of have about another three slides worth that just weren't that important or that worth mentioning. There's a lot of things the scheduler actually does when you get down to it. Airflow supports a lot of different use cases. It's more than just run this task every hour or every day. Um, so what does the scheduler consist of? What are the kind of the main components? There are three components. Um, there's the scheduler job, which is kind of most of the logic. Um, it's a bit of an umbrella term, but the scheduler or the scheduler job, that's the main part of the scheduler, which is effectively, it's the state machine. It kind of progresses everything across to try and run your tasks, retry them, etc. like that. There's the executor, which the scheduler kind of hands tasks off to and says, please now go and run this. Um, and then there is the DAG file processor or DAG parsing, um, which is responsible for reading your DAG files on disk and putting them, ultimately putting them into the serialized DAG table. So starting with the scheduler, um, I should kind of kind of uh, just caveat all this information is based on the kind of the current state of the main branch as of today, the 14th of July. Um, so if you're looking at 2.0 to, 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 to kind of onwards, um, up to now, it's slightly different. Some codes moved in a few places, but it's largely still the same. But this is obviously kind of as it stands today and what will be in 2.2. So most of the scheduler lives in this airflow.jobs.scheduler job package. Um, there's a class inside there called scheduler job as well, but that's where it all lives. Um, so yeah, kind of like the, the first point of the scheduler is like its job is to manage this state machine. So like kind of the primary concern is to run tasks or task instances and kind of get them to the right. Its job is to get them to the right until it can't get any more. Um, they start in none, go to scheduled, queued, running, and then one of those. Um, in this is simplified, so it fits nicely on a slide. There are a few more states in here. Um, there, there is a more complete diagram um, in the FO docs. I believe it's under the kind of like the scheduler concepts page as more complete thing. But this gives you an idea. This is what the scheduler is trying to achieve. Um, and one of the is kind of key ideas behind the scheduler, behind Airflow actually for for most of its life is to never load DAG code, user code into a long running process. Primarily this was kind of, or initially this was so that um, if you change the DAG file on disk, you didn't have to restart a server, but it kind of has some, you know, if you change the DAG file on disk, you wouldn't have to restart the, you know, there. Yeah. Whenever you deploy a DAG, there we go. Whenever you deploy a DAG, you wouldn't have to restart your schedule and your web server and, and your workers to get it picked up. So that was kind of the original reason for this. But it also has some kind of extra side benefits of like dependencies can change and you don't have to worry about input paths or reloading modules or anything like that. It's just much simpler if the DAG code is only ever loaded in a short-lived process. Um, and kind of one of the one of the big changes between 1.x and 2.0 onwards is the the scheduling decisions. Previously, 
the scheduler and the DAG parser kind of operated in a fairly tight loop where the DAG parser would parse a DAG, hand it back to the scheduler, and then the scheduler would only schedule that one. Um, right, kind of with 2.0, we kind of broke that down the middle, and the scheduler only operates on the serialized representation. You know, it's a big JSON blob with a with the schema from the database. So that you can have one side write to the database and the other side just read. And essentially, they're independent at that point. They don't actually need to talk to each other directly. Um, this was one of the big speed ups, which is particularly if you have a lot of DAGs or a lot of DAG files, I should say. Um, the scheduler can now operate as kind of as quickly as it can without having to wait for the parser to come back around. So that's just kind of background and, and, and setting the scene. So what does the scheduler do? Like, how does it operate? As I said before, it's an infinite loop. Um, so kind of like this is at a high level what the scheduler does. So first off, do some scheduling logic. Like, do whatever we need to do. I'll get onto that in a minute. Do some, do some scheduling. Um, then make sure that the processor agent, which is... Uh, it's, a, it's a helper class around a DAG file processor. So make the, make sure the DAG file processor is still alive. If it crashed, restart it. Um, right now, it kind of one scheduler has one DAG file processor. So, so you need those together. Um, heartbeat the scheduler itself to make sure, hey, yes, we're still alive. Um, and then run some timed housekeeping, uh, detecting zombies, adopting tasks, checking if you know, the database is out of state, if you manually delete a DAG run, things like that. So it just kind of, you know, checks, yeah, every 15, 30 seconds, whatever, run, run, run some tasks. So that's, that's it at a high level. Um, so if we go a level deeper, we have this, um, which hopefully from the method names, you get a rough idea of what each of these does, each of these method calls functions is doing. Um, this is real code. I've kind of removed a few lines and a lot of comments, but this is this is part of the do scheduling function from scheduler job. So like this is this is the code. Um, so kind of breaking it down one by one. Um, create dag runs. Um, so. I mean, it does what it says. It creates a DAG run. Um, there's a a column on the DAG model table, um, which says next DAG run created after, which is kind of like pre-computed, and it tells the scheduler what is the earliest date that I can create the next DAG run. Um, and for every row where kind of like that SQL, you know, next DAG run create after, where, where every row of that is true, it goes and creates... The DAG run, it loads up the serialized representation, it creates that DAG run, so it creates all the task instances effectively. Um, and it then recomputes the the next DAG run and the next DAG run created after. So it's like, okay, I've just created one, when's the next one I can create? Um, so that's kind of quite straightforward. Um, in 2.1.3, which will be the next point release, so 2.1.2 has is just in the process of being released. The next bug fix, 2.1.3, will contain a change where the scheduler only initially creates DAG runs in queued. Um, and then there's a separate step, start queued DAG runs. Um, previously, kind of like the check for max active DAG runs was kind of littered through a few places and there were edge cases where if you cleared an old DAG, you could end up going over this limit. Um, so yes, kind of Ephraim, who's you know on my team, he's also speaking on Friday about XCOM, um, he made a change where DAG runs are only created in the queue state. And then this one place in the schedule, this one place is where DAG runs go from queued to running. So by having having that check in one place and everything else just putting them to queued, it's much easier to maintain the uh, this actual max active runs concurrency limit. Um, so yeah, it just kind of, as, as I said, it goes through find all the DAG runs that are in queue state and ch checks how many are running of that DAG and puts however many it can for each DAG into, into running. Um, oldest DAG first. Oldest DAG run first. Get next DAG runs to examine. Um, so yes, kind of, as I say there, get the next N oldest DAG runs in a running state. Um, 
when I say oldest, um, there's a column on Dag Run which is last scheduling decision. So kind of as I kind of alluded to at the start of the talk, scheduler from 2.0 is now highly available. You can run more than one of them. So we have to have some way to make sure that the schedulers cooperate and don't try and all fight for the same ones. So there's a column which says whenever any scheduler last touched it. So basically all the schedulers just kind of walk around in, in a loop picking all the DAG runs that are currently running, you know, DAG runs that have things to do. And this one just gets the list of those DAG runs. Um, and then we schedule the DAG run. Um, it does various things like run timeouts, um, handles callbacks, checks if the DAG structure changes. So kind of, you know, Airflow doesn't have great support for dynamic DAGs, you know, where you change the structure, the graph of your DAG on the fly, but it does work. Um, the UI is a bit clunky and there's edge cases, but it works. Um, so this is kind of one of the things we do, which is a simple check to see if see if the ch the, the structure has changed, if there's any tasks that have been removed, any things that have been added that need to be created, things like that. Double check, you know, just like, hey, has it changed? Do I need anything to do? Um, and then a lot of the, the work of checking the dependencies. So, you know, depend on past, um, checking upstreams, checking trigger rules, checking any custom dependencies if you have any. You can you can set dependencies on a task to, to a custom class and it can be checked. That's all handled inside dagrun.update state. Um, it's badly named. Um, someone should kind of take a look at it. Um, if y anyone fancies digging into this, uh, create an issue on, <coughs> on GitHub and I will happily walk through how this works in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of... Update state does a lot of the, hey, this task is now ready, ready to be scheduled. It doesn't change it. It just... Ah, there we go. Update state doesn't change it directly. It returns here a list of tasks that can be scheduled, and then schedule dag run will make sure that those tasks are put into the scheduled state. So, um, kind of, I guess the difference between the scheduled state and the queued state um, schedule says this task passes all its dependencies checks so this task can be run whenever airflow chooses to um, at, at this point kind of tasks in the schedule state they don't take a bit up any resources they don't count as running tasks but um, queued task and concurrency limits are all handled here so like once a task is in queued, Airflow says I've had the Airflow scheduler says I've handed off control. I now treat it as running because I don't know when it's going to start. I no longer have control of this. It is the ex executor's responsibility. So at this point, um, it's kind of yeah, it it, it counts as running. It was, it's you know taking up a slot in a pool, things like this. Um, I'll come on to why this is called critical section in a minute, but this kind of executes all the task instances. Um, these two previous, these two steps are independent in that they don't pass data between each other. So one, the first one just takes whatever the, the task instance into whatever state and puts it to scheduled. And then this one takes uh, task instances from the scheduled state out of the database and um, tries to put them into, put as many of them as it can into queued. Um, so what might stop that? Before you can enqueue a task instance, before the scheduler can pass it over to the executor, it checks a few things. Um, th there are enough open pool slots, um, kind of don't, as of a few versions ago, the number of slots a pool, a task can use in a pool is now greater than one. It's not limited to one task, one slot. That the per DAG max active tasks limit is set. That the task concurrency limit, which is the kind of like this task across all DAG runs, of this DAG, concurrency limit, um, and that there are executor slots available. Um, so it's kind of s some complex stuff. Um, yeah, as I say there, everything else about the, the task state, the upstream, is already checked before the task is put into the scheduled state. So kind of by splitting it in, in two, two phases here, um, it comes, it helps when we come to HA and you have multiple schedulers kind of cooperating a bit because you can have different checkpoints and different transactions. I'll come back onto that in a minute though. So the executor, um, 
the Executor is where the Scheduler sends a task instance to actually execute. Um, strictly speaking, it's not the Scheduler doesn't say execute it because it doesn't know where it is, but it's like, okay, this should now be run. Please do whatever you need to do to make it happen. Um, the Executor interface is a little bit kludgy. Um, if you caught Andrew Godwin's talk on Monday, um, his kind of like newcomer's guide to, to the architecture of Airflow, one of the things he complained about was the, the ex executor interface. And he's absolutely right. It's It works, but it's a little bit kludgy. Um, there's some kind of not quite well-defined back and forth and events. And it, 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 it's... It needs someone, you know, it, it, it would value from someone sitting down and thinking about it and go like, right, okay, let's define a clear interface. What are the boundaries? What would it work? But right now, what does the scheduler do? Um, it tries to run them. So it, if it's the Kubernetes executor, it spins up the pod. It kind of builds the pod, pod specification and makes sure that when the pod boots up, that it runs the right command to execute this task. Um, if it's Celery, it... Sends the sends a message over the the Celery broker to go like, hey, please go and run this task that the worker will then pick up. Um, if it's the local executor, it will send it to one of its local process pools. And if it's the sequential executor, well, why are you using the sequential executor for anything other than command line use? Um, if it's the sequential executor, it runs it there and right then and there inside the scheduler. Um, this is the re main reason why the sequential executor is not fit for anything other than very simple testing. Um, because Python Python can be multi-threaded, but it's predominantly single-threaded. It works best. Whatever. Threads are not common in Python. Uh, the sequential executor runs the task code right then and there. It waits for it to complete before returning, which means that scheduler can no longer heartbeat. So if you've kind of if you've run the scheduler sequential executor locally, you'll see the message in the web server saying the scheduler stopped heartbeating. Um, that's why. Don't use the sequential executor. Um, one thing to note about the executors is they predominantly keep their state in memory, um, which sounds like it might be a bit of a drawback, but it actually makes things a bit easier, and it's, there's ways of cope working around it. Um, it means that, particularly when it comes to HA, if a scheduler, and thus the executor, which is run as a it's just a process. It's just a class. It's not a separate process. It's a class inside the scheduler. That, you know, scheduler dot scheduler job dot executor. It has an executor. Um, so if that falls over, another one can pick it up. And by keeping things in memory and, and kind of like almost enforcing that model, it means that when another one starts up, it has to be able to recreate the state from from, from external queues. Um, so yeah, it just kind of. It sounds like it's a drawback, but I think it actually simplifies things a bit because then the executor doesn't need to speak to the database. Um, tasks, if a task fails, 99% of the time it can report its own status to the database. And there's a slight, conf slightly confusing thing where the task can be failed, but the command job, the execute this command succeeded. Um, there's a distinction there. It's it's internal to the scheduler and the executor, but the distinction there is: did this command run to completion? Not did the task status complete? Um, the one case where the scheduler and the executor have to work together and, and handle that is this task command failed, like and it failed so early that the task couldn't even report its own status. Um, so for that, like the schedule, the executor's job. Sorry, I'm getting the terms confused. Uh, you know, the executor's job is to kind of monitor those those commands, those processes, those pods, whatever. And if they fail so hard that the task couldn't report status, to report that status as an event back to the scheduler, so the scheduler, scheduler can go, oh wait, this failed, and update things appropriately. So that's kind of the scheduler and the executor. So we've got tasks going through the state tree, um, state machine. And we've got the executor, so tasks handed over to it and they actually run. Um, but right at the beginning, I said the scheduler operates on the serialized DAG table, but I haven't yet talked about where that is done. Um, so DAG parsing, um, yeah, how, how does how does this work? 
Um, ooh, bad formatting, Ash. Um, there is the mod package called um, Airflow DAG Processing. Um, and this is the only place inside Airflow now, as, as a 2.0, where user DAG code is, is loaded. Um, it used to be loaded directly in the web server. That is not the case with 2.0. Um, or 1.10.7 when you enable DAG serialization, but you know with 2.0, that's never that's never true. Except you know this is the only place it's loaded. Um, previously, it was split across these two packages. It was kind of a bit a mix, a back and forth, and things. Um, it's recently been tidied up and sorted out. So if you're looking at the code on main now, it's it's a lot easier. There's just one package with two uh, files inside that kind of handles all the processing code. So. <clears throat> The DAG file processor manager. It's a bit of a mouthful of a class. Um, it is a class that manages DAG file processors. Yeah. Um, it is run as a sub command, sub process, I should say, um, using kind of the Python multiprocessing framework. Um, and it maintains a pool of sub processes that actually go and load the DAG file. Um, and they also pe execute any uh, pending. DAG level callbacks. So task level callbacks are handled in the at the end of the kind of the, by the task instance executor, task instance supervisor. Um, but yes, it, the the DAG level callbacks are, are handled here. Um, each of these little kind of sub processes, its job is to parse one DAG file, update the state in the database, and exit. This kind of ties back to one 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 of the uh, the original points the caveats which is don't run don't load dag code into any long running process um particularly that's kind of important when it comes to dependencies or side effects of you know, importing a module and kind of some weird caches by keeping it isolated to a short-lived process um we don't have to have any kind of reload hooks or anything like that which you do have problems um the manager, um, again, it's another infinite loop. I think this is the third, fourth, whatever. There's lots of infinite loops in Airflow. This one just sits in a loop. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of what the, this is the main loop of the DAG file processor manager. Um, it starts, it, first off, it, it checks its list of processors. Uh, by default, there's two, but you can configure that. And if you have a large number of DAG files, you will probably want to up that. Um, it collects the results from the processor. Um, it checks if any, you know, do, do I have space to create any more processes? If so, it creates one of these. Um, it periodically, every five, 30 seconds, I can't remember which, doesn't matter, every so often, it sends a heartbeat back to the scheduler going, hey, I'm still alive. Um, and even less frequently, five minutes by default, it does a an LS, you know, it, it lists every file in the DAG folder and you know pulls those out. So the kind of the parsing process, um, yeah, it it parses the DAG, it executes it. Um, it does it doesn't just kind of load the module normally. Um, possibly for for historic reasons, it kind of gives each DAG file needed an an, an it imports it with a custom module name. Like if you if you dive really deep into the Python like import lib or imp uh, standard libraries, you can say, hey, load this this file, but give it this name. Pretend it is called module x, and the module name we give it is something like unusual prefix and then a random string, and then your module name. Um, and I suspect that's probably not that necessary anymore. It, it's, it has a few kind of advantages, I guess. Um, by doing that way, if you have a DAG called... I don't know if you had a DAG called Airflow.py. Um, if you just if if Airflow just inload, uh, loaded the module by the by the normal name, then that will be first thing in the import path, and all the rest of the Airflow code base wouldn't be importable. And none of the the packages would work because this DAG has, has overwritten it. Um, so that's that's kind of it's an extra level of just like let's make our users not have to think too hard about what they call the DAGs. Um, I mentioned earlier that the scheduler, or I hinted earlier, that the scheduler doesn't execute the callbacks directly. Because to execute the callback, 
you need the actual Python function, not the string of it, but a Python function you can execute. And to do that, you need to have loaded and passed the DAG file. So the scheduler actually kind of conceptually sends callback requests through through all these through these layers and kind of caches them and catches them and passes it down so that when a DAG file is going to be parsed, once it's passed the DAG file, um, the parsing process can go, hey, there's a an SLA or a on fade a DAG level on failure callback and executes those. Um, one thing that is not mentioned here, at least not shown on the slides, um, there are a couple of modes of what when, when you're starting a new process, what what DAG do you look at next? What file do you look at next? Um, there are three modes, maybe two modes. Um, there's the default used to be random, whatever order the OS decided to return the, the directories in. Um, it's also possible to do it alphabetically, so that you know if a if a DAG file starts with an A, that will be parsed before it starts with a Z, that kind of thing. Um, and every time around the loop, it will start again from this order. Um, there is also um, a predictable but random. So each scheduler will always execute files in the same order, um, but one scheduler to another scheduler will have them in a different order. So this just kind of gets you some kind of sort of, you know, you just shuffle them by a, by a predictable seed that's kind of like the host name and the PID, that kind of thing, um, so that the order is consistent but different. And then the final order, which can be useful if you have um, large deploys or l large kind of large number of DAG files and a way of deploying files to a running instance, is to order by file modification time so that whenever you if you modify a file it will be it will get put to the top of the queue and get passed soonest which means it kind of goes goes through the list and every time it comes back to the top it will then reorder the list by modification time and um pass it that way the other way of kind of like short circuiting this and putting things to the top of the list is when this callback request comes through um the file it points to is automatically put to the top of the list um so that kind of like you know there's a callback pending Pass this DAG with the next. Pass this file the next time you start a process. Um, so it kind of reorders things on the fly there. Um, cool. So that was just kind of like how the scheduler works. But one kind of big thing I haven't really talked about here is how does the high availability mode of the scheduler actually work? Um, so AIP 15, um, it was about three, four months of work. Um, a bit more elapsed because I was off on paternity leave for six weeks of that. But um, it was, yeah, one of the kind of like key decisions we had to make when we were talking about doing this was what's the fundamental architecture? Do we have component to component uh, gossip communication or do we all go via a central process? Um, and we decided to go via the existing metadata database. So Postgres, MySQL, now MSQL. Um, I recommend Postgres just kind of by default, by the way. Um, we use that for, for synchronization. There is no direct communication between any processes of Airflow. Um, so... Yeah, like the other option would have been to use something like Zookeeper or etc. D and kind of use that, which has a a lead, you know a leader election and its own gossip protocol. You need to run three of them and things like that. But um, honestly, that's operationally a lot more expensive, a lot more complex to run, a lot more difficult to keep active, and more kind of computationally expensive and resource expensive. And we don't really need it. Um, databases relational databases, Postgres in particular, can scale really far and do, do quite frankly, an amazing job. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we just went, right, let's just use the database. Um, one of the key things we use is kind of like row-level locking. 
because we don't want two schedulers to fight each other. So let's say, for instance, we have um, this uh, sort of sort of example. Um, so the we've got scheduler one and scheduler two. And they're, they're, they're both in the stage where they need to look at some task instances. Like, this is obviously kind of, like, reduced. There's a lot more conditions and things like that. But um, Scheduler 1 issues the query first, like, a few milliseconds before Scheduler 2. And they both go, oh, they've, they've both hit task instance 1 and 2. So this is, this is not good. This, this, this is bad. Um, there are ways around this. You could do a set state equals new state, where state equals old state to avoid changing things but then you've just wasted effort of you've had two schedules compute the same thing and had one of them throw the result away so it would be possible but it's not the best way so the next thing we can do is you can add four updates to the query this is a way of it's a kind of fairly standard i think it's standard sql it's supported almost everywhere um and it's a statement that says take an exclusive row level lock on any row that this query returns so if, if something else tries to make the same query it will sit there it's kind of like if you're at all familiar with kind of concurrent programming um it's a mutex it take you know take a mutex lock these rows no one else can have them which is better in some extent because it now means that schedule two isn't wasting its time computing something that schedule one has already computed but it sits there. It waits. It tries to get those two rows again. Um, so that means that Scheduler 2 sits idle, which is also not great. So we use the next trick, which is skip locked, um, which kind of does what it sounds like, I hope. If rows 1 and 2 are locked, when Scheduler 2 issues its query, um, it, Scheduler 2 skips over it and goes, hey, here's 3 and 4. Um, so kind of one caveat with this is that the rows are locked for as long as that transaction is around. So if you commit the transaction or roll back the transaction, the locks are also rolled back with it. Um, so you need to be careful about, we need to be careful about where exactly, um, Transactions are committed in Airflow, particularly within the core scheduling loop. Because if you had a mistaken transaction that was committed, your locks are gone, and then it's kind of not really clear what state things will end up in. Like, it won't break because ACID compliance means things are generally okay, and there's all sorts of other checks to make sure that um, the state, the tasks are in the right state before they can run and stuff. Um, but, yeah. So, before I showed this code and i said it was kind of almost verbatim domain scheduling loop from the do scheduling function <clears throat> i clearly lied a bit because it's a, it's a lot longer than that but one thing i did admit for the sake of brevity was this so there's a decorator a context manager that's the word a context manager um we use called prohibit commit um which is kind of listens to uses sql alchemy and listens for the Python, anything trying to call Python, Python level commit function. Um, and if it's on the session object, it errors. It just hard crashes the scheduler. Um, it's basically saying like, you should not be doing this. It's a, it's a developer error. Um, this is mostly for us when we are working on airflow, but it's kind of, a, it's still there at runtime because if it's escaped, it's kind of, we can't reason about the state of the scheduler. So all bets are off at that point. Um, so yes, if you try to do session.commit, it fails. The only way you can do it is if you do guard.commit. Um, and obviously anything else, anything outside of this, where the guard is in the scope or past the guard, can't commit it because it doesn't have access to it. So it, this ensures that we don't accidentally release the row level locks too early. Um, so to kind of loop back around, um, I said critical section, and I'll come back to this. So what is a critical section? Um, in kind of like <coughs> concurrent programming, so yeah, threads or whatever, concurrent programming is it's a it's a choke point that says only one process can be in this block at at a time. So it's kind of if you have two streams of work, you have you have a 
critical section in the middle and only a single process can go there. Everything else will wait on the side and then it, it can go through. Um, so why do we need a critical section in Airflow? And what is done inside the critical section? Um, ultimately, we could do without it, but it's a massive performance improvement to have it. It might sound slightly strange to have a um, critical section be a performance improvement, but one of the things this function does is it checks concurrency limits. And the big one is pool concurrency limits, because those are global across your Airflow install. So to check the pool limits for a task, let's you know, call it task A, and I, you know, I have one slot in the default pool. Before it can calculate that, it needs to know how many tasks are currently running in the default pool. And in a world where there are multiple schedulers that could create tasks at any one point, the only way to do to know for sure is to ask the database and go, you know, select stum from task instance where state is running or queued and pool equals default. But if we had to do that for every single task instance, that would be an awful lot of round trips to the database. Um, so we've taken optimization. Um, at the start of this function, you kind of we we take a we take a lock on something. I'll come into it. Calculate how many running tasks there are across all the pools. Keep that in memory in Python. Update it by just doing plus equals one. Um, and then we release the lock at the end. So how do we, what is it that we lock? We lock every row in the pool table. Um, this critical section is normally held by a scheduler for 50 to 100 milliseconds at most. And that's, that's long. So this is fine. It's a very small critical section. It has minimal computation because it knows it can just go like, there's no checking to do other than these, the, 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 four th the four limits are, you know, Pool, pool concurrency, task concurrency, and DAG concurrency. Those are, those are simple. They are just kind of compute some numbers and compare them. So it, it's a very quick section. Um, but again, so like, you know, it's, this is fine, this works, and this is performance improvement. But this is a critical section. So as, as I mentioned, described it, if one process is, if a scheduler is stuck waiting for another scheduler to release the critical section, it's sitting there doing nothing. When it could do other work, it could... Um, create some DAG runs, it could schedule some more tasks, it, it, it can do, there's lots of more useful work it could do. So we use this no wait thing, um, <clears throat> which is rather than sitting there waiting, and there's no point doing skip locked here because we've selected every row. Um, so yeah, we, we, we fall back and we just go like, don't, don't, don't tell us, don't, don't sit there waiting, don't try and skip everything and give us the other rows, just like, Give us an error back straight away. We capture that, and we just go on with the rest of the loop. We start the loop again, so we do the scheduling loop. We do the create DAG runs. We do scheduling and things like that. Because there's lots of other useful work that a second scheduler can do while something else is in this. Um, if you're curious to see how often this happens, there is a metric emitted. Um, so if you've got stats D configured, there's... I can't remember the name. You have to check the docs. Something about critical section missing, missed or something like that. And you can see how often it happens. It's not a problem if it happens a lot. It's just kind of... For your information, we, we emit a metric. Um, so yeah, this is just like, hey, I lost the race. I can do some more work. Um, so that's kind of the two big parts so that two schedulers can cooperate with each other. Um, one of the other key design decisions we made was active, active, so that two schedulers are both fully functional. They both do as much as each other. And one of the things that can happen, and you have to kind of, in, in this kind of, you have you have to accept that a scheduler can disappear at any point. The scheduler, you know, if it's running in Kubernetes, say, the pod just goes. That node died. Hardware failure, it's gone. It can't report back. You have to account for that kind of case. Um, so one of the things we, we, we do to support, support this is um, called task adoption. So there's a couple of checks we do every so often. This is one of the this is one of the periodic tasks I mentioned earlier on um, in the scheduler loop. This checks for dead schedulers. So kind of if a scheduler job has not updated its heartbeat, which is in the 
job table in the database that hasn't updated the heart base, heartbeat, um, one of the other schedulers will notice and go, hey, scheduler123 um, hasn't, hasn't reported in for five minutes. I should try and adopt any tasks that are run by it. So this is another optimization. If tasks are not adopted, they will eventually be noticed. Um, either they will report in as a success or failure, and that'll be fine, and they'll, and they'll go, through, go back through the normal scheduling loop, or they would have been detected as a, a zombie if their task, you know, let's say it was... No, let's not say it was a local executor, that doesn't make sense. Um, you can run multiple local executors if you want, that's perfectly valid, it's, it's fine, it's a little odd, but it's supported, it works, it's, it, has its set, it has its use, I guess. But yeah, so... Let's say we've got the Celery Executor. That makes more sense. It's more common. Um, if you have the Celery Executor and the tasks are... Um, one of them has an error. We want to be able to notice that, hey, we sent this job to, sh to Celery, but it never reported in. Um, if we didn't notice this, we would eventually notice the task is a zombie and just kind of hasn't reported in forever. But, um, yeah, this, this, this by adopting the tasks... Um, we can notice things quicker. Um, and it's kind of key part of the active active model. Um, and then I guess kind of other things the scheduler does, as I say, detecting their schedulers, adopting tasks, um, detecting zombie tasks. So if a task hasn't, is, is still running and, you know, Celery thinks it's running, but the, but it hasn't reported in, we need to kill it and, and restart it. So that's one of the things we do. Um, SLAs are handled by the scheduler. Um, there's kind of all quirks with SLAs, but that's where it's handled. Um, there's also a further optimization we do, um, which is kind of, it, it was originally called fast follow, but that's not what it is. We're now calling it like a mini scheduler. So in the worker, wherever a task is run, um, at the end of, let's say, task A here, whenever it is run, there's a mini scheduler that looks at all the downstream tasks and basically go, hey, so task A finished. Can I put now put task B or C into into the into scheduled? Um, this happens in the worker. It's got all the information there. It knows something just happened. Like I've just completed a task, or I've just changed the state of a task. Failed can lead to downstream tasks being running. Um, so this kind of happens. Yeah, it happens in the worker. It's an optimization. It kind of cuts a few sh loops out of the cycle. Um, can be turned off most of the time. That there, there, there were a couple of bugs in a few previous releases, but it should be fixed by now. It's just some optimization. It improves your task to task latency. So from task A finishing to task B or C starting, this is one of the ways we've got to reduce that optimization. Um, so that was a whistle stop tour of the scheduler. Hopefully that was useful.